right. Welcome. Welcome again. Welcome to Data Driven AI Meetup. And today, today is Tuesday. Today is a great Tuesday to help another instance of our Data Driven AI Meetup. This is a series of meetups about technology and AI organized by Taloka. And my name is Dmitry Stalov. I will be your host today. And at Taloka, I lead research team, I lead the education team, and I lead open source team. And today we'll talk a lot about machine learning, which is ML, about human labels, and about crowdsourcing in particular. And the overall, an overall topic is focused on content moderation. And I have a very uh, brief question. Can you hear me well in Zoom, in here? Yeah, hi. Good. Can you hear me? Good. So uh, let's start then. We have great sponsors. We have uh, Tabula, who offered the office space here. We have AliExpress, and we have Booking.com. And the overall organizer here is the Taloka company. Very well to see you here together. And the clicker should work. Does it? Let's start. Oh. Okay, so uh, if you need Wi-Fi, you can use the Tabula guest access point, and the password is welcome to Tabula or Tabula. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So the same label is available on reception. If you can, if you can't uh, photo it, you can just run there, and you will see the Wi-Fi password. And Data Driven AI Meetup is a series of meetups organized through. Uh, all over the world. And we have many, many topics uh, presented before from NLP to many, many other things all related to AI. And we have a series of events in Israel and today is one of such an event. Uh, we will be talking about content moderation today, but nevertheless, it's a big community of speakers and people who attend these meetups to hear some uh, expert voices about artificial intelligence and related fields. So you can scan the QR code to access the meetup page and it will be all available to you. And so the agenda of today's meeting is very, very simple. We have four items in this list. The first one is uh, item moderation for AliExpress uh, presented by Elena Gruntova. Uh, then we will have a talk about, uh, about Tabula and content moderation Tabula by Gal Cohen. Then we'll have a break to network and to have some drinks. And finally, we will have the panel discussion uh, with several participants moderated by me. And if you have any questions about Taloka or computing is hard, uh, you can ask us questions. So we work at Taloka and uh, today at this meetup, we have our CEO, Olga Migorska. If you ask questions, you will receive answers and most importantly, you'll see and receive gifts from our community. And thank you very much for attending this. I'm heading the microphone to the next speaker, which is Eliana Gruntova, CPO at AliExpress. Eliana, thank you very much for coming. Hi, guys. Happy to be with you today. I am very proud to present the case. It's a case study on moderation. I am Elena uh, Gruntova, CPO of AliExpress CIS. And we are presenting a case study of uh, item moderation for multinational e-commerce, which is AliExpress CIS. And please let me show in more detail what I'm talking about. Thank you so much. I mm. must be doing something wrong, I believe. Okay. It doesn't help. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I hope it's the worst thing that has happened with us today. <laughs> uh, everything uh, must be better following. So what is AliExpress says? It's actually a unique thing because AliExpress says a joint venture. And we have Alibaba as our investor, and we also have local investors. Uh, AliExpress says sell items from Chinese sellers to people in 10 countries in CIS, such as Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and so on so far. So you can easily guess we are big in buyers, right? Uh, we are also quite big in sellers. We have more than 400,000 sellers on the platform. 
And you can imagine that this amount of Chinese sellers do have a huge lot of items to sell. So we're really, really huge in items. We have 200 million items in our product service, which makes up for more than 3 billion SKUs. That's a big amount of data. Uh, so when the challenge for data moderation arised for this amount of items, we definitely knew that we needed a solution that would be highly scalable and very effective. I believe I need your help. Not that easy, right? Okay, so why does the challenge for moderation arises at all? Uh, first type of reasons is always local regulation reasons. We work for 10 countries. You can easily guess that they all have different local restrictions and law regulations on what can be sell, sold in the country and what can't, right? Uh, moreover, this field of uh, legal regulation is not a stable one. There, there are always changes, news, new laws, things that come in and come out. And so we have to keep up the pace to stay in current, right, in these fields. On the other, uh, on the other hand, we do have Chinese sellers. They do their job very well. They sell items. And I assure you, they know nothing about legislation in our 10 CIS countries, as you can easily guess. Uh, and we do not want to burden them with that knowledge. That why? That's why the moderation task is the task for the platform to do and to accomplish. Uh, another type of reasons, uh, which comes up as a question for moderation and, and as a matter for moderation, are uh, cultural differences reasons. And that's a very sensible and quite intriguing domain which we will discuss a bit later in my presentation. Okay, you can just tell me when. Okay. I will, uh, it would be a bit funny. Yeah, okay, thank you so much for your help. Uh, we had to build our moderation process from scratch. Uh, Alibaba does have a moderation process, no doubt. But what they do for moderation is global moderation. They just regulate by Chinese law and they don't go into those niceties about all other details of re, uh, regulation and restriction. We had to go from global to local. So we had to build up this process from scratch and we started definitely with uh, shaping what we want as a product from our moderation and which types of items should be moderated and which product consequences we should have for these types of items. So uh, at the same time, we aimed to keep it's simple to keep, to keep it coherent, right? So that's the result with which we came up after this process. And let me walk you through our results in a nutshell. Uh, basically, we classify everything in moderation into five main classes. We get the class that is okay. It means that this product can be shown everywhere without any restrictions, just is okay to be sold and okay to be shown to everyone. Uh, second class is the most intriguing one. It's restricted. And let me skip it for the moment. Uh, I'll go to this third class, which is adult. And I hope everyone here understands what, what stands behind this notion. Uh, everything that will limit the children to, but which is okay for adults. We just check the age at the entrance for these items, and that's okay. Uh, prohibited. Also a big class of items. Actually, that's the main target of the moderation. Uh, the items that should not be sold, so they cannot be shown on the platform for different reasons. And we have many, many different classes and reasons why our items might fall into this class. The last one. Uh, I hope someone is worrying here about the fifth class, because it's unheard of to try to understand fraud through evaluation and moderation processes. And guys, you're absolutely right if you're worrying about it. It's not how we determine fraud on the platform, definitely. Uh, we put up this class, actually the last one of all our types, for the simplicity for our annotators. 
they just came through such items and when they met them and they had these four classes, they just didn't know where to put it, right? And we didn't wait from them to really understand if it's fraud or not. So should it be prohibited or not? So just for the simplicity of annotation, we put this fifth class to make the process smoother and easier. Uh, let me show you some examples. These all are real AliExpress products which have been sold on AliExpress, believe me. This is an okay product, right? Very nice kid's toy. Things we adore to sell to people. Uh, second picture is also a toy, by the way, but not that nice, right? Uh, that's what we restrict on the platform. Uh, when I say that we restrict it on the platform, it means that this item can be shown and can be, uh, can be bought if you go by direct link or if you go by direct very specific query. But we do not take such items and we filtrate them out when we build general recommendations. Or if the person never, ever, ever visited something like this and never clicked it. So these items are of restricted demonstration of the platform. Uh, I will explain later why. Uh, the last one, also a restricted class. Uh, it's actually uh, in Russian, but I put a small translation uh, near the uh, yeah, near the tissue. Next slide. Uh, clear, right? It's prohibited hemp oil uh, because it's a, an illegal drug. If someone asks, the last item that's definitely fraud and that's tricky. What you see here is Spotify subscription and you definitely can buy a Spotify subscription. Why not? The key thing is that the seller is not Spotify. And if you look into the description in more detail, you would see that it's just illegal uh, intellectual property resold here. So this is direct fraud. So it should be prohibited. In a nutshell for the classification, yep. Overall prohibited items for sales, just some more examples for you and everything that's prohibited. What's specific about all these class? Because of many laws and many uh, restrictions and many documents explaining all this, this class is more or less formalized, right? You can put strict rules, you can add details to your annotators so they can easily understand if it's prohibited or not, if it's legal or not. Okay, not that easily. Gray zone always exists, but still it's doable. Whereas another class that we're talking about is not as easy. Right, uh, we're speaking about cultural differences. Uh, culture is a semiotic system, like language. When you have a text in one language, you have to translate it to another. Same goes with culture and all uh, attributes of culture, such as symbols, such as slogans, such as gesture, behavior, traditions, and everything. And when you meet an international e-commerce like AliExpress, where sellers belong to one culture, but actually buyer, buyers belong to different other cultures and many of them, you meet the need to translate the culture and sometimes to restrict. Let me show you some examples. Our main topics where we met with that cultural differences are here on the slide. Uh, naturally, it's body matters. Who she needs when they sell something that's related to medicine. It's unheard of not to show you the results before and after. Chinese sellers are absolutely sure that if they show you the results and the initial stage, they create trust. Buyers from CIS, when they see it, first thing they feel is disgust. They would not go into the details of what's sold. They would just close your app and would try to never return again, whatever you are selling. Same to other body matters, personal hygiene. Uh, Chinese are very direct and very sincere in what they show, right? Uh, that's not so for the usual culture in our CIS countries. Our buyers would never, ever, ever 
buy things with such advertisements. Mm -hmm. More examples to go. Uh, funny jokes, that's easy, right? They also don't see anything like insulting or disgusting and showing this directly to your face when you go to your commerce site. Just imagine yourself going to, I don't know, your regular commerce, your favorite one. And the first thing you see here is one of these. What would you think about the platform? Would you return to it? Mm -hmm. uh, last but not least, funny story about symbols, which definitely need translations, right? Uh, for Chinese, they're just some popular pictures, whatever. And for some people in CIS, they're insulting and disgusting and inappropriate. The last case, I believe, is the most interesting. The items, we get so many complaints about fraud because what we sell here, do you get it? We sell money, right? We sell money made from gold plate or made from silver plate or from some other material. Looks at least crazy, right? Actually, it's not absolutely crazy to Chinese sellers. They have one of the biggest Chinese e-commerce, which called Taobao, also, by the way, owned by Alibaba. And this fake money is in top 10 popular items on Taobao. You guess why? Because Chinese do use them in their ceremonies for, uh, for, the, for their dead, for the memory days. They burn fake money in the memory of their dead. And that's a very, very respectful tradition, quite regular. So everyone buys it. And no Chinese seller would understand why this very popular item is sold so bad in sales countries. The platform should be wrong. That's what we get here. Uh, so much for cultural differences. And in a nutshell, that's what we restrict on our platform. Yeah, these are our rules. Disgusting, insulting, obscene, and so on and so forth. What's tricky about this class, if we compare it with the previous one about prohibited items? If prohibited might be formalized, and you can explain to people and give the instruction what's prohibited and what's not, and more or less get consistent results, how are you going to explain to people what's disgusting? Or if it's insulting or not, Actually, all the mass media discusses these problems, right? And we hear more than millions of opinions about each point, if it's disgusting or insulting. And here we uh, found out a way out uh, with the help of crowdsource and approach to crowdsource through Taloka, which I would explain. Um, that's just to give you the uh, impression of how much actually items are under, get under moderation. What's funny here is that definitely when our marketing specialists choose items, their results are the best. Nearly no items that should not be publicized or should be restricted, right? But if you see at what actually people search for and get in our results, you see that the results are lowest, the last column. Or if you see what they buy, they definitely do buy prohibited items because they don't have so much ways to get it. And that's free for sale right here before your eyes, right? That's, that's not a good thing, actually. Some of these people do actually go to prison after they do their payment. And that's not a good way. We, sh we should prevent it. That's why we should moderate it. Uh, how we find these items? This is how. <laughs> Uh, okay, some more comments, I got you. Uh, actually, we do have several stages in this process. Uh, we do uh, acquire a daily set of items for moderations through very different sources. Uh, we have different reasons for which we might think the item to be uh, needed in this day set. Our goal here is actually to cover all our product service. You remember it's 200 million, right? You, you all are now thinking I'm crazy, right? You're right, I'm crazy. Uh, the key thing here was to limit ourselves, definitely. Not by the items that we have, but by the items that we really do show to people. Yeah, by impressions. So if we do show these items uh, often enough, then it would, go, it would go to our process of moderation. If that's an item, 
for which no one or nearly no one searches or goes by the link or through any other way, then we can leave it for later. And as you understand, it helps us diminish the overall set of what we actually do need to moderate uh, 10 and 20 and 100 times, right? And that's much more sizable quantity. Uh, after we gather our queries, after we gather our items for daily set moderation, it goes to ML process. We get reviewed uh, raw data. It goes to our ML model, uh, and we get the verdict of our uh, ML model. The verdict goes in two ways. First of all, the model decides true or false, gives us the classification, right? And it's okay class or any other class. That's the first thing. But also the model at the same time provides the probability threshold, which means whether the system, the algorithm is sure or not about the answer. That's the key point. So we uh, take where the system is sure and put it directly to our database and down the whole process to our product service and to our punishment base. And we take the items where the system is not sure at all. And what we do with them? Right, we put them to Taloka for crowdsource, asking people in cases where machine can't give us an exact answer. We put them to Taloka, we get the verdicts from Taloka. And also after these verdicts, these items go uh, to database. You see, right down there. Uh, but you see also another arrow. We use them twice. We don't only put them to Taloka. We also put them into the learning set for our ML model. So that next time our model would perform better and threshold would be higher. And we optimize and automatize more share of items that we have to moderate. Uh, in more detail about Taloka process. Uh, our verdict manager, uh, probability above threshold okay, probability uh, above threshold not okay goes to database. Gray zone, that's always the most interesting point, right? Uh, we take up this gray zone and it goes to items from for crowdsource to Taloka. Uh, in Taloka, the process is basically uh, basically, uh, the process in Taloka basically consists of three parts. First of all, we gather our annotators. We do train them in Taloka. And after this training, they pass an exam. Those who do pass get the real production tasks. These are people who have learned our rules and who have learned the, the point of view which we as products want to get as a result. Right? Uh, when they get to production tasks, they can meet uh, tasks of first level or tasks of second level. All items from uh, this gray zone actually go first to these tasks of level one. Uh, three people see each item independently. And the, all the three, uh, all three uh, people give us their verdicts. So we, give, we, we get three verdicts. If we get some consistency, that is majority vote, three out of three or two out of three told us the same, then we think that we know about this item. It directly goes to the aggregation results and all aggregation results, and they go to our database. If these people give us different results, and you remember we have five classes, right? That's why it's quite easy to get not consistent answers. These items go to the second task levels where we uh, already take the majority out of seven. Um, the structure of the task itself is also not that simple. It's not that we only take the data that we need and just put them into task. Uh, yes, we do take these gray zone items, but we also add golden set items here. What is golden set items? These are the items that we're sure of, absolutely. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, golden set items are the items that we already know the answer to. 
and we check all the time the precision with which we do get the answers from our overall of our process. That's why even in, when we go for majority vote, if some people who give us answers are not precise enough, we can dynamically add people to get more consistent uh, and more expertise a majority vote. That's how this process works. Mm -hmm. uh, just to show you how we gather our daily sets, there are actually three different sources of main items that go through our moderation process. Product priorities, also analytical inputs, and also inputs with thresholds, right? And you see the, the screenshot from Taloka, how all these daily sets are in process of moderation through CrowdSource. That's how our task looks in Taloka. We have a link to our item and you have to choose between the verdicts. You just click on it. Mm -hmm. Overall results. We started our process uh, in June last year. And now we have grown up and scaled this process to the level that you can see here on the slide. Uh, it took us six months and a team of five people, no more. And the local people, of course, right? As a result, uh, what I wanted to cite here is the main thing probably is that moderation to our understanding and to the process which we've built is not just a simple process of human annotation or even a more simple process of OML. The effective and scalable way, which we do like and which we have built from scratch is a complex of general classification model and human evaluation. And actually these two parts do help each other. Uh, using effective and scalable crowdsource allows us to estimate such tricky things as insulting and disgusting as we've seen with you together before, right? Which cannot be formalized. Getting this knowledge and getting these examples helps us teach ML to also start understanding these things, right? At least to try and differ between these things. Uh, and what's even important, we use these same uh, annotations to improve our model, to optimize, to automize and to make the overall process cheaper. As you've seen on the previous slide, we started spending like two times less for each item to be moderated through six months. Uh, let me say that I'm, due, that I'm really proud of my team here and of this process because it was built from scratch and that's not the process that the Lebaba have been building for 10 years, but a team of five people, six months and Dollar Express. That's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Eliana, so much. We, it's, it's, it's amazing to see the project of this scale. And I, I just want to say that we are a bit uh, over time because we started later because of these technical issues, but we do have time for some questions. And if you have any questions, you can just raise your hand. I'll come to you with the microphone because we are streaming our meetup and I'll just give you the mic. Questions, yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, am I right in my understanding that I, you do not, or maybe I didn't uh, hear, how do you take into account uh, feedback from users? Maybe you, uh, this model makes mistakes. Thank you so much. Uh, it's true, I didn't speak about it, but it was somewhere on the slide, actually, for my return. Um, absolutely, yeah. We definitely have a feedback loop here. Uh, you see, right? We have users' feedbacks so that also goes through uh, back, back office process and just goes directly into the database. Just this share and the percentage of what we get through this feedback loop is uncomparable to the sizes that we get through the main process. That's why I didn't focus on it. But thank you very much for your question. Okay, more questions? Yeah. We're, we're more so, sorry, I, I have to give the microphone because we are online. Yeah, sorry. You want me? Sure. Hi. Do you have model for each language for each uh, 
Okay. For each uh, uh, state, country? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, our ML model does have a lot of features, like more than uh, 400 features. The text features are a sizable number of them, but not all. Uh, we do the seats for each country and each language. And actually, what the model does is looking for similarities. In this case, the absolutely accurate translation itself is not that important. The key thing is that the main signal is kept. And even if the text features are not that high, what we can do, the model still runs on the other features, such as customer behavior, such as image similarity. And if at least in one language, we do take the text feature is high, the model takes into account it also for other countries, though with lower scores. I see, I see a raised hand. Let me join you. Just out of curiosity, uh, you, you mentioned the crowdsourcing. If you are exposing uh, the, the customers to disgusting and uh, prohibited, it's uh, prohibited. So how do you expose them to those pictures or information? Good question. Thank you very much for your question. When I speak about the crowdsource, I definitely don't mean my customers work for me. They may through user feedback if they want. But when I speak about the crowdsource, I am mostly meaning annotators from Taoka who just sign an agreement and who agree to see sometimes probably inappropriate or disgusting features. But that's that's the job. Um, yes, sir. Uh, okay, one more question, and we also have a few questions in the Zoom, so we want to ask them. I think you were the first, so please. Um, in AliExpress, each page has a context, it means the title, the image, and the description might be not uh, violative or not or appropriate by itself. So, how do you label uh, the whole uh, item in Toloka? I'm returning to the screen uh, to make it seen. We do not divide the item. We just direct the annotator to the whole page as the user would see it and directly ask if by annotator's opinion, it belongs to one of the classes or not. For example, one word in description on the third screen might be offensive, but not on the first two. Uh, I bet majority of annotators would miss it or would not answer it's offensive. Why is it okay for us? Because the buyers would feel the same. Like most buyers would think it's completely okay and completely appropriate. If the title or the main page is disgusting or offensive, be sure buyers would feel the same. That's why it's completely okay for us just to go to the direct page of overall. Yeah. Now I have to ask a few questions from the Zoom chat to involve uh, people into conversation online. And if you have more questions that we did not have much time to answer, we will have the break and also we'll have the panel discussion in which we can be flexible in terms of what we discuss. Uh, so I have two questions from the Zoom chat. The first one is, what is salary rate for good enough assessors? You can set it up. You should find a balance between quality and price. Absolutely, all crowdsource work and actually all e-commerce work and actually every platform's work is always about looking for a balance. And what we do, we do look for a balance. We like make metrics, we look for our normal distribution, right? And we'll look for optimization point. No secrets here. Mm -hmm, thank you. And the second question is, do you use training to really train or to filter the annotators? Uh, <laughs> you would be surprised. We use training for training uh, and we use exam for filtering. I mean, even if people don't pass the exam, they might go back in some time and train again. And that's actually the same with all our exams, right, in our life. You can always train better and pass your exam, even if it was difficult at the first pass. Yeah. 
like two levels of validation. Yeah, it sounds really like a two-factor authentication, but generally when we teach crowdsourcing, we say that you have to provide if on a large part a means for rehabilitation of those who made a mistake. So it's uh, an essential part for something big. And we have, uh, well, we shifted our start a bit and now we are out of time. Thank you very much, Elena. It was a great conversation. It was amazing. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we have our next talk and let me just move the slides and the next talk by gal korean yeah so i will i will be clicking because we don't need it so, okay so because the camera works here okay so yeah <laughs> okay, so now we have a talk from Tabula. To want some consideration that Tabula Truth is out there by Gal Cohen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good evening. I am an AI product manager here in Tabula, uh, working with uh, the policy team, the content review team. And I just want to get to know you. Who here is a data scientist? Please raise your hand. Who here is a developer? All right, uh, product managers, and none of the above. What do you do here? Anyway, uh, tonight you don't have any titles. Tonight you are content moderators. So I want to welcome you into Tabula. You are uh, gonna do some content moderation for us for free. And just before we get started, um, I wanna uh, start your training in just one second. But before that, a few words about Tabula. So Tabula is one of the largest content recommendations platform in the world. What it means is that we have two types of customers. The first one is publishers like a news site, you know, Ynet, CNN, NBC, MSN.com, that have like news articles. And the other type of, ad of customers that we have is the advertisers. And the goal of the advertiser is to sell their product or service but by putting on the advertisement in the news place. So these are the customers that we focus on. And next, we have two goals at the, as the content moderation team. The first goal is to block non-compliant content. So if you are a big and famous publisher like CNN.com, you might not want some of those images, right? So our goal is to entirely reject them. They should not be in our network. Goal number two is to label correctly the ads. So what it means is that we can see a specific item, and this item can be from different categories, different quality levels, and also different types of advertisement, like call to action, or just to like branding, different types. The goal here is to correctly label them because we want to allow the publishers to block certain categories. Like for example, let's say you are Disney.com, and publisher. You might not want alcohol advertisement in your website, right? Because you know you have kids. So this way the category is important. And next on, we're gonna start your training. Okay, you ready? So I have some challenges ready for you. First of all, I'm gonna tell you what is the policy rule, and then you should do your best to follow it. So the first policy rule is this. The category of the ad, must reflect its actual essence. Okay, you need to decide what is the category. This is the ad. And you have two options. First, real estate. Second one, gossip. Who says real estate? Raise your hand. Who says gossip? Oh, uh, okay, you got it right. Uh, yeah, it's actually gossip because the true essence, like if you're going to click this advertisement, you probably won't going to buy a Malibu beach house for $11 million. And if you do, I want to work for you. You're probably just interested in the celebrity, right? So the category here is gossip. But what we've seen here is that human review is not really consistent. And this is one of the challenges that we have. Inconsistency. The first challenge with human review. Okay, challenge number two. Policy rule, celebrities cannot advertise products unless 
they are getting paid for it. Okay, second example. Would you approve or reject? Who would approve it? Who would reject it? I think you got some tips. Okay, so anyway, he is a celebrity. I think the policy role might have tipped you off. His name is Azim Premji, and he is one of the most famous Indian businessmen in India. So the thing is that he's probably don't get paid for doing this advertisement. And the thing here is that our human reviewers, which are basically Israeli based or in the Philippines, Morocco and Bulgaria, they might not know him, right? Like local celebrities are pretty unfamiliar and it's very hard to identify it. We're gonna... It usually is fraud, by the way. When someone uses celebrity without their permission, it usually is fraud, cloaking. We have many challenges there. Sorry? Okay, that, that's another story. Yeah, I'm gonna mention the image recognition in just a few more slides. One last challenge. So the content policy rule is Tabula does not allow any disturbing imagery. You ready? Okay. Uh, by the way, this is German. You are not that tired. Okay. Uh, so who here would approve it? Raise your hand. This is a kneecap, by the way. It's a kneecap. Who would reject it? Now, what if I tell you that this specific advertisement is making $85,000 per month for Tabula? Now, if you work for Tabula, who here would approve it? Raise your hand. So it's not a clear cut because sometimes there are some business considerations to be made before we take a decision and we must consult the business. So this is another challenge we have with, with human review that the policy is sometimes a bit vague. Sometimes we need to get some guidance. All right, so these are the challenges and decisions are tough, right? It's very hard for us. It's especially tough because we have so many decisions. We have around 150 decisions each day. I appreciate. What can we do? So we do three things. The first thing is that we have to remember that if we make a mistake, I'm gonna get a call at 2 a.m. from our CEO, Adam Singolda. It's enough that only one image will get approved by the mistake. And yeah, it was an easy time for me. Not my best hour, 2 a.m. But anyway, we have some precautions. So the first precaution, first line of defense is automation predefined rules that are basically good for like straightforward, you know, obvious decisions that you don't have to think. One example for it, let's say we got this image. This is like a uh, photoshopped animal. I think a combination of a few different animals. Let's call him Philip, okay. So let's say Philip came along yesterday and it got rejected by a human, okay, human reviewer. The same image gonna come back again today. And then we can use automation to compare the two images. It's very simple. And to reject it as well, right? Very clear cut. The second way we enforce the policy is by AI, right? It's an AI meetup. And we use AI like machine learning models that are very good for standard decisions. Okay, they are, can be a bit more sophisticated. Let's give a few examples. The first example is the image safety. What the image safety does, we can show it two different images. One is compliant, the other one is non-compliant. This model can highlight the problematic areas and the output is, is it safe or unsafe? So each new image that comes along, we check it with this image safety and give an indication to the human reviewer, like a red flag. Another example for an AI model that we have, we have the face recognition that we can use for celebrities later on. These are some of my uh, teammates from Los Angeles. And we trained the model on a single picture. And once we provided the model with an image, it very easily identified each of them. So the blue ones are the one that it got identified. The red one 
it is un 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 unidentified. Just an example for CUAI models. And the last content review method is human review. We call it CRT, the content review team. And basically they do the hard work, the hardest decisions, the vague one, uh, if the category is very risky, they are the one gonna decide what should it be. So this is just like a glimpse to their platform. We call it Comet. So basically what a human reviewer does, it goes over on all of the queue, item by item, opens the URL, decide what is the category, what does the content safety, and no pictures, please. I'm kidding, okay, I can take a picture. So these are the three different methods that we have. All right, who do you think makes the most decisions? Automations, raise your hand. AI. All right, half and half. Uh, content review team, the human review. All right, and the correct answer is automations. So 65% of all new advertisements go to automations. Only 4% goes to AI currently, and 31% goes to manual review. That's the situation right now. And if we compare AI and automations together, we can see that AI or automations is 15 times more impactful than AI. It's a bit uh, anticlimactic in an AI meetup. I know maybe it's not the smartest decision to show it here, but we think that we can all get along. And especially automations, it's not that powerful because it had some downfalls. So one of the downfalls is if we got this, remember Philip, it got rejected yesterday. And today Philip brought some friends. Now, as you can see, they, are, they look pretty similar, but that this is not the exact image. Automation will not catch it. And many of our customers that try to put like uh, images that attract your eyes and want you to click on it, they try to, uh, you know, I don't want to take game the system, but they try to trick us. So this is the image that they put, but we can't recognize it. It's too bad, right? We got those pictures, we can't reject them. So we send them to manual review. And we review the same images manually over and over and over again. It's, it's really uh, insane how much time the same images comes back and again in this slightly different uh, uh, model. Anyway, AI is very good for this, this kind of decisions. And this is when we embrace the concept of AI powered automations. AI and automation working, working together. And what we did is to come up with a new AI model. The AI model is called image similarity model. I think Elena also mentioned it. So this is the model to that we came with. And basically this model has two purposes. One is to say similar on a couple of images, are they similar or are they not? These are the outputs. All right, next on, let's see, let's look under the hood. How does it work, this image similarity model? Let's take the two images and we need to find a way to compare them. Right now it's like pixel to pixel, but it's a bit hard to do. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna use embedding to turn it into a number that we can represent on a graph. We do it the same for the, both of the images. And now each image has a numeric representation of the image itself. And what we can do next is to simply calculate the Euclidean distance between the two images. Let's call it X. Now, if the distance between those two images is smaller than the threshold, the model will say similar, they're close enough. But if they are not close enough, they are X is higher than the threshold, then the model will say not similar in a very high level, how it works. Okay, no problem. We have this model, we set a random threshold and we went on our way. Let's test it on a few, uh, few images. First pair of images. So the one on the left, Obama. On the right, it's not Obama. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a random citizen of Indonesia. <laughs> There's no uh, blood relation that I know of, or is it? That's for another meetup. Anyway, it is not the same person. 
So let's say someone used Barack Obama's picture and it got rejected because he's a celebrity, right? You can't use a celebrity. And then a very similar image came along. The model said similar and we will automatically reject it. This is not the right decision. So even though the images are similar, it's not the same person. So the decision should be different. Example number one. The last example, another pair of images. The image on the left is non-compliant because of, I think you can see, and the one on the right, it is compliant. So let's say a human reject the first image, a similar image comes along. It is the same image, it is the same person, but the one on the right is compliant, the one on the left is non-compliant. Similarity is hard. We need to find a way to define what, what is similar? What does it mean to be similar? Which basically means which threshold should we use? This is our challenge. So we have AI, we have automation. This is the time to bring the humans into the picture. We have to ask content reviewers, trained content reviewers to help us to determine what is similar and what is not. All right, next on. We gave each reviewer two images, okay, Philip A and Philip B. We chose three different reviewers and used the majority rule, majority vote to decide what is the ground truth. Is it really similar or is it not? Reviewer number one said those are similar. Reviewer number two, those are also similar, but reviewer didn't three, voila, didn't agree. So the ground truth for us is similar because we use majority vote. But what does the AI model say? The AI model say it's 0 0.55. Okay, what do we do with this number? We have to pick a threshold, right? If this number is gonna be smaller than the threshold, the AI model will say similar, right? So the first threshold we chose, the random one was 0 0.8. Because uh, if we compare those two, 0 0.55 is smaller than 0 0.8, and we will, the model will say, Similar, right? Because the actual distance is smaller than the threshold. So we say similar. Okay, cool, let's choose another pair. The other pair of the two barracks. Review number one said it's similar. Also, the other two said it's not similar. The ground truth is not similar, right? Very simple. The AI prediction for those pictures is now 0 0.75. So this is the AI prediction. And if we compare it to the threshold, it is still smaller than 0 0.8, right? So again, it is still similar. But now the model is not correct because it is different than the ground truth, right? So this is a mistake opposed to the first one, which was a good call. If we want to assess this AI model, we need to compare it uh, with AI related metrics. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, right? Precision, recall, and accuracy. So the precision of this first threshold, because we, the model said similar, and each time the model says similar, it got it right only in 50% of the times. The precision is 50%. The recall is 100% because it caught all of the similar images. And the accuracy, because half of the, of half of the decisions are correct, is also 50%. Okay. This model doesn't look so good to me. Let's try another threshold. The second one is 0 0.4, sorry. Sorry? Yeah, so there was... Yeah, there was a suggestion to increase the amount of images, which is correct. So in this example, we compare only two pairs, but in reality, you know, we did it on hundreds of images to select the right threshold. And for this second threshold, we can see 0.4, the threshold is smaller than the actual result. So the model we say not similar. The distance is too far from the threshold. And this is a right call or a bad call. What is the ground truth? Similar, so this is a mistake. It didn't get it right. For the Obamas, it said 75 is higher than the threshold. 
So it said that this is not similar, but this time it got it right. So again, we can complete the table. The precision is undefined because you can divide by zero. Like there is no similar answer here. The recall is 0% because it didn't catch any of the positives. It didn't catch any of the actually similar pairs. And the accuracy is 50% because half of the answers are correct. All right, okay, last threshold, I promise. Let's hope we're gonna get it right this time. The third one is 0 0.6. 0 0.55 is smaller than 0 0.6. So we say similar, is it the right answer? Yay. And the second one, 0 0.75 is higher than the threshold. So we say not similar. And also this one is equal to the ground truth. So this is also a correct answer. We're gonna put it in the table. The precision is 100% because each time he said similar, it got it right. The recall is 100% again because it caught all of the similar pairs and also the accuracy, all of, all of the decisions are correct. So this is a very uh, introduction for AI metrics. Okay, we have the threshold and we launched, we launched. So the impact of this model, let's see it right now. So what he did before the model, 65% of all advertisements were reviewed by the automations, 4% by AI and 31% by the manual review. Once we created this model, we had a new slice to, to the pie. We have AI powered automation and it covers 11% of all advertisement. And we can see that the manual review was reduced from 31% to 20% allowing the content moderator to give better service to the customers, to reply on chat, reply on cell phone tickets, and basically uh, give a much better service. This like the aftermath. And so when we created this model, we selected the most, the most consistent reviewers, like senior reviewers more than a year with Ebola that have a very high percentage of consistency. And this is how we created it. And uh, before we part ways, few takeaways, and we're gonna have the, the Q and A that can just one second. I will give you the mic and everyone will hear. Uh, so first takeaway is keep an open mind. If you are a data scientist, you might wanna check automations because it is very powerful. Don't, it's not like everything has to be go through AI. Sometimes the combination is what really makes the difference. And if you are a developer, think about a, an AI solution. The second takeaway is to use best practice. What we do here in Tabula is most of our models are not developed in Tabula actually. It's, they are free. They are from the open web and you can use existing models and just do some manipulation to fit them into your own product. So it's free and you, you don't have to build your own model each time you, you are facing a problem. And the last takeaway, join Tabula. It's really fun here. So thank you so much. Thank you very yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. We have many, many questions, and you I think yeah, it was you. Yeah, thank you. I will come to you very, very soon. Yeah, please. Standing or sitting? As you wish. Okay. You mentioned that uh, the CRT job went down by eleven percent. How do you continue training the model? Or you don't need to? So basically let me pass it. Automation. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we we launched with the model only six weeks ago, and we already see the difference. So there's no need for retraining. But we keep uh, so for each automation or for each AI solution, a human is reviewing it. So some of the manual reviewers are basically monitoring the decisions of the automations and the AI, just in case you know we make a mistake, because sometimes the combination of the image and the text may create the wrong impression. And it's very difficult for an eye to identify these kind of nuances. So monitoring. Mm -hmm. Good, more questions, so you please. So uh, the training is the same for all images or do you have subcategories to each one, the own rule and the own training? So as far as the training goes, we want to focus on the most inconsistent pairs. So if we see that it's hard for us to compare 
uh, images of, uh, I don't know, uh, people in bathing suit or celebrities, this is the one that we're gonna be trained on. So each, each few weeks, we plan to uh, run a, a sample check, see where we got it wrong, and then to retrain the model again on the most inconsistent pairs. But will you run the same, same test on, on the picture of toys or celebrities? Yes, it's the same one, same test. More questions, please. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I thought about when I watched Philip or the uh, very nice goal that you showed that you could maybe add another layer of comparison. So if they're like similar, like above 50%, you can try translation, rotation, reflection. I mean, just, you know, take the one picture and compare them scaling. These, these are actually the tricks that those that try to trick you are using. So if you, you, you do that, I mean, if you turn Philip, it would, uh, you know, rotate Philip or do the reflection, you'll get like 90% similarity. And then you would choose the best score of all those. And then, okay, that, and, and this will be the true similarity, not the 0, 0.55 5 because it's rotated. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> we have some openings. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Thanks for, thanks for the tip. All right, so more questions? Uh, yeah, please, I'll come to you very, very quickly. Um, two questions, but they're short. First of all, um, how many uh, samples did you use to train the similarity model? Because you said it was, uh, and, uh, it was uh, humanly curated. And the second one is, once the um, AI-assisted automation worked, could have it replaced the old automation or are they complementary? I like this work because I have time to think on the answer. So uh, for the training data set, we had 2,400 uh, pairs of images. By the way, a uh, story about it. The first time we asked reviewers to moderate it, we told them, tell us if it's similar or not. But then we had this example of this woman with this uh, top part and without it. And they said, yes, those are similar. But we didn't want them to say it is similar. So we asked, are they similar? And would you get that sa the same decision? So this is one thing about the, the training set. And this is a complementary to what the AI currently reviews. It's a complementary for the automation, actually, that misses it. OK, so we have at least one Zoom question. And the question is, what are the best heuristic automation rules? OK, now I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm just a product manager. I don't know. But uh, whoever asked it, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, please uh, contact me after this talk, and I will connect you with the right person. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. So, give me a sec. Yeah. And now a very pleasant slide break. Plus networking. We've had two amazing talks. Please enjoy the time, and soon I will invite you to the panel discussion. Enjoy. Okay. So thank you for for joining again. Uh, it's what we called panel discussion about capitalized moderation. And let's discuss this, this phenomenon. And we have three amazing speakers from Booking.com, uh, from Tabula, from Taloka, and from AliExpress. And I will... <laughs> so who will moderate the moderators, right? I will moderate the moderators and... I'm a human, I make mistakes. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we have roughly 45 minutes for the entire panel uh, discussion. We have three, three sections. Uh, I prepared questions for the speakers. But before we start, let's check the sound by asking every person in this panel to briefly introduce themselves. And please go ahead. It should work, the microphone should work. So hi, nice to meet you. My name is Milan. And I'm an engineering manager in Booking.com here in Tel Aviv. Um, what else? Um, uh, hi, I'm Gal, works in Tabula, AI product manager. I've worked in the past in Moveit, uh, gaming companies, startups. Cool. Hi, I'm Olga. I'm the CEO of Taloka. Uh, previously, 
Uh, I was responsible for the service of moderation in a large search engine company, so I have some experience in moderation as well. Uh, hi, I'm Lena, and if I didn't get fired after my previous talk, I am still still at AliExpress service. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a promotion. So, and I and Dmitry, I will be your moderator today. But back in the day, I was getting my PhD in NLP, and I even got a postdoc in NLP. And now I'm doing something interlocutor related to uh, all what we see here. So, actually, we... Dima is modest. He's head of our scientific research. <laughs> yeah, I I'm used to. So we have <laughs> nothing about hardcore science today we are all about content moderation and uh for uh, I, I propose to split the section into 15 minute slots and uh, every slot will be somewhat dedicated to each question i will read it out loud so don't worry you don't have to watch back i will try to remember them and uh i will ask every panelist to give maybe their brief um experience about their content moderation journey usually you don't build uh, the perfect content moderation system from scratch it's a very painful process involving many steps and many iterations and to make it a success well you've seen the case of aliexpress they uh, spent roughly maybe 18 months right six to, months si oh, six months well you had five people okay right. <laughs> if, if you if you if you if you add more people it will be lo uh, longer okay so <laughs> so and uh I, I can be ask everyone to maybe say something about their process. So what they had at the beginning, maybe one year or maybe two years before ago and right now. So let's let's start with maybe uh, AliExpress case and then go forward. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I will keep in these limits. Speaking about the company, because AliExpress says as a joint venture company, just advised not more than three years ago. So we didn't have that much journey as a company itself. But speaking about our team experience, I should mention that part of our team had before some experience in C2C classifieds, which definitely helped a lot because C2C classified is the way to learn everything about moderation and automation. Uh, we started with just some planning actually. Right. We complained to our Chinese colleagues, uh, showing them examples, and finally, not getting full understanding, uh, understanding on every point that we come up with. Like sometimes they just didn't see what the problem is, and they were completely sincere with us. That's where we started somehow understanding that actually the problem is not that direct as we have thought about it, and that's where the whole cultural difference uh, idea grew from. Uh, now we believe that we have a rather mature process. We definitely know what to do better here, and we definitely know how to optimize it. But overall, I believe that though a year ago, it was on the top of my product priorities for AliExpress. Like one of the biggest problems AliExpress had was that we have a lot of uh, this bad content displayed for our buyers. Today, I believe this problem is not on top. And that's a huge win for me and for the team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and Olga, your experience, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my experience is like on my previous job, uh, I was working at Yandex, which is one of the biggest uh, Russian and European search engine companies. Uh, and among other things, for several years, I've been responsible for the moderation department. Moderation is very important for the search engine company because the major source of revenue for the search is actually ads, uh, like quite similar to your case, uh, and ads displayed either on the search uh, engine results or on some content services. That's why uh, the moderation of ads and moderation of user-generated content uh, was a very important uh, part of the task. And by that time, when I joined uh, that team, uh, there were the challenges, first of all, that actually the moderation was designed pretty much in the way like uh, you described, in a way that it was uh, the combination of automation, uh, just direct uh, regular rules, AI and some human moderation. But the problem was related to the human moderation part because it was actually con consisted of uh, some 
pretty large number of in-house experts uh, and there were problems like first of all with to be honest costs of the whole the whole organization because if it's a labor heavy um, occupation there are lots of people they need to sit in the offices it was the pre-covid era so people uh, needed to sit in the offices you need to find spare spaces for them etc 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 so it was uh, kind of not cost effective. Second problem was that it was not scalable when the business was growing, new services were emerging, but every time there was a bottleneck in moderation, like we want to launch a new service with user generated content, but uh, the moderation department is not ready because we don't have moderators free for, for that. That was a bottleneck. And the third challenge was to be honest, that kind of nobody could understand what's going on there because uh, like uh, the whole system was relying on the expertise of those people who have been moderating the content for the 10 previous years. So they had a large part of their expertise kept in their heads, but very few part of expertise somehow formalized. So you could not approach uh, them with some with any formal metrics. You could not understand the quality of their moderation, the formal SLAs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what we did that time, we actually introduced the approach of the crowdsourcing into the moderation process, which finally uh, like resulted into the pipeline, into the pipelines quite similar to what Lena has been showing uh, in her presentation. When there are complex uh, pipelines of uh, efforts of thousands of independent performers, which are uh, which include some cross verification um, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and which which makes that uh like the process resistant to mistakes of sing single performers uh so what we did we introduced uh like taloka into the process and also kept it uh, like a pyramid when there is automation then there is the crowdsourcing and then on top uh, there is some li very limited amount of we still kept several, some in-house annotators who really keep like the expertise which cannot be uh, like automated in any other way and it that all was going on like maybe four or five years ago already. And since that time, I think that we uh, see uh, the uh, the facts that prove that we were on the right track, although the whole reformation was quite painful, but still after that, uh, within Taloka, we already see many clients who are using the same philosophy, like for example, AliExpress and we, uh, we also see that we managed to restructure the whole process of moderation within Yandex, which resulted in the, in the fact that now it is a scalable and manage, manageable process. And we are also happy to see that now this approach is undertaken by more and more clients on the local platform. So manage many, many moderators, I think, right? And uh, if, we, if you any of you have questions or comments, we do have enough, enough time, so just raise your hands, I will come to you, and we will uh, just raise your questions and comment to our panel. And uh, Gal, so could you please tell us your moderation journey? You have a huge platform and you have a huge user base. Probably you should have a huge moderation team, don't you? Uh, yeah, we do. So when I came a year and a half ago, the general um, idea was to was emphasized on manual review. We had lots of manual reviewers, over 100 and the automation and the AI um, didn't do the heavy lifting. So in the past year, we really try to uh, scale it as much as we can because automation is consistent. The SLA is perfect. It's all, almost uh, instant. And it can also uh, improve the approval rate. So what we did, we identified like uh, trusted advertisers and they get automatically approved. So this is also a way to reduce some of the manual work. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from this year is communication, because as content moderation, we need to enforce the policy. We should know what is right and what is wrong. And in the past year, the policy became much more clearer and it was communicated in a better way because a year ago, policy talked to the content review team, the manual review, it talked to the automation and to the AI, and we each review differently. So the AI did decision A, the manual review did decision B, and it really uh, upset me because the AI was measured by a human. 
So when the human saw what the AI did, say, oh, this is bad, it is not good. It, improved, it affected our metrics in a negative way. So right now we have a very uh, good communication and cooperation between the policy, the human review, and then AI and automation. So, yeah. And I, I have a question here. So there are so many moving parts actually from the metrics, uh, your KPIs that you use for acceptance of your change of sense, uh, the content moderation team or content review team, you said with CRT, right? Uh, you also have automation, you have AI, you have many, many, many things. And how much time did you spend to build all of these things? How much time you spend into building those? Well, you, usually you have people who implement all these things and how much time did you spend for this? And so it's since the beginning of uh, Tabula, we keep iterating on the process, we keep improving our, our methods. And I think specialization, like to divide the different uh, categories into specific reviewers so that the same reviewer will not review both a uh, home and garden category and also insurance. So they are have um, a specialization in specific uh, types of advertisements. So it's also helped to increase the consistency. And so you, you classify, so prior to sending to human, you somehow classify those advertisements to keep specialization. Yeah, the AI give the prediction and according to the prediction, we give it to the, to the reviewer. Now the prediction is not always correct, but we do, uh, we do our best. Uh, so you have specialized reviewers for maybe medicine, for maybe toys and so on. So you, and how do you onboard them? How do we? How do you onboard them? Onboard so them? You, 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 uh, someone say, I want to be a moderator at Tabula, and then they uh, join some, uh, they apply somewhere, and uh, how do you decide what they should do, maybe retail stuff or not retail stuff? What's the onboarding process here? So for the onboarding, actually, one of the people that managed the human review team uh, is, is here. And <laughs> basically, what we do is we have like a, a, a two-month program, presentations, tutorials, we then give them items that are not being sent to production to measure their accuracy. And only after we are happy with the result that we are getting, we're sending them real items. So they're, they're not always aware if the item is indeed uh, real or not. Mm -hmm. And so you have kind of control items. Yeah, you have the items with uh, pre-annotated responses and you have to, um, you, you have to like, refresh them every time. How do you do that? Yeah, some of the annotations are not getting sent to production. Some of them are being sent to two different reviewers that just because we want to test the consistency. The consistency. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And again, if you have any questions or comments, you are feel free to, to ask us. Okay, so Moran, nobody has to ask you what booking.com is. <laughs> that's, that's a good part. Uh, the bad part is you have so many hotels there. That's not an advertisement. Uh, how, how do you, how do you handle them? Yeah, so maybe our use case is actually different from what the guys uh, described. So my team is a, a platform team uh, that is building um, actually um, general models um, that are consumed by uh, booking in-house department. One of the department is the moderation department. Um, so we are building like uh, multi-level image classification and multi-level uh, text classification. And then the depart the moderation department are consuming this, um, um, these predictions. So for example, um, I will describe uh, some use cases in booking, um, but um, there are guests uh, that um, are uh, um, um, participating or um, hosting in the, in the hotels. So um, they upload a review uh, when they uh, after they post booking, and they can also upload images um, from their um, visiting. Um, so actually, these images uh, is the user generated content, and they need to be moderated because uh, we found some images with nudity, uh, with drugs, and this kind of labels. So our, our multi-label uh, classifier, one of the um, classification labels can be these uh, uh, labels. And then we um, um, uh, send these, um, them to the um, uh, moderation team. Um, so they have these labels uh, for every image in real time that get into booking. And they know like if it's, this is an actual nudity image or drug image or other class uh, labels that we have. Um, for textual, uh, actually, so for every review, we need to moderate uh, uh, any 
each review that they're getting into booking. So uh, we know to say if the review is containing like inappropriate words or violence um, aspect in the review. Um, so th these are the kind of use cases that they are using our platform to get the predictions for the reviews and the, and the, um, and the images. Um, other kind of use cases, for example, if a partner upload an image uh, with a logo or with a call this um, hotel, and then they are tr actually trying to um, get customers um, calling uh, directly to them instead of using booking. So we need to moderate these kind of images as well. So we have actually a label for logo, certificate, sign in the image, and we identify this as well. Um, so there, and, and each one of the uses that I just described is a different department in booking. So each department is calling our service, our platform, to enrich the content with these predictions, with these uh, labels. Um, and then they are doing their own uh, automation um, for that. What I can share is that for um, uh, hard approved images, like that they get very, very low threshold of not being nudity and of not being this kind of uh, labels that we have. So they're automatically approved, but the ones that have uh, very low threshold, even very low threshold that uh, we have any doubt that uh, it's belong to this kind of label. So uh, it's going to be moderated by human. Um, so if we're talking about journey, so one thing that I can share is that now we are doing auto fully automation process for Facebook advertisement, for example. So for Facebook advertisement, we want to choose um, an image. Like, yeah, I don't know if you're familiar, in Instagram or Facebook, you get some booking advertisement, like book this hotel, and then you see an image. Um, so how, uh, so we use the main image that the partner is uploading but we need to choose the images, the appropriate image to, to, to show. So if we have bathroom images, or again, images, we have a text, logo, um, or images, um, I don't know, with sink, toilet, uh, all of this. So we need to, or people, even people, we don't want to show people uh, in advertisement. So um, we are doing automatically process to uh, choose just images um, for this advertisement that are not with these kind of labels. Um. <laughs> uh, no, no, that, that, was, that was very, very interesting. And I have a few follow-up questions. And the first one is, so if you want to use, so by images, you mean the hotel images uploaded for the hotels, right? So there are two types of images, P, uh, PGC, like partner-generated content, and mm -hmm. UGC, user-generated. UGC, okay, I get it. Yeah. And uh, for the, for example, for advertisements on Facebook and other social media, you usually want something not just, you know, uh, non, uh, non uh, restricted or non uh, uh, offensive, but you also want something aesthetically pleasing. And I can understand uh, how to automate the uh, offensive uh, image uh, moderation, but how do you select the most aesthetically pleasing images of your premises? So for that, we have another model. We have quality. <laughs> model that uh, give a, a score between one to ten for every image by the technical quality of the image we have it also okay okay <laughs> not a competition <laughs> so wanted to ask do you use uh, user behavior features in this quality model like clicking Nice question. Um, so actually we have a technical quality model that's just about the technical quality of the image, like the brightness of the image, the color of the image. And we have CTR based model that is more attractiveness of the image. Like if they are like uh, how many clicks we get uh, generated for the image, but we have a bias there because people tend to press on images of swimming pools and this kind of um, beach images. Uh, so we are now dealing with how to uh, deal with this kind of bias. Yeah, definitely. Why do you have separate models about tech quality and customer features? Why didn't you just like build one, the best, give me the best image for Facebook and that's it, and in incorporate all these features into the model? What drives you to, to take several? So models? we actually use them for different, well, it's not related to moderation, but okay. <laughs> but we actually use them for different use cases. Um, it's like uh, depending, like if we have like uh, email marketing, so we will use the attractiveness one because we want the person to get into the hotel. Okay, gotcha. But if it's more for, um, I don't know, other type of, just we want to 
to show images that are um, uh, with this uh, uh, label, but we know it's it's not that just that attract that like the attractiveness of the city are. We want to see mm -hmm. like images of a bedroom that we know that the bedroom is is very high quality, like technical I quality. See. So we need to combine like the classifier That's of the labels with the technical quality. I see. For Thank example. you so much. I promise my last question. That the, the question that always triggered me as a user. Like <laughs> you do have very many photos from users. Why are you sure that these photos do refer to the same hotel that they describe? Yeah, How sorry, like <laughs> uh, I mean, you do have very many photos, user-generated content photos. User-generated, okay. User-generated. That's that's important. Yeah. How uh, are you sure that these photos from this specific user do refer to the same hotel that he writes review about? How do you do it? I, I don't know. It's not my responsibility, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, That's cool. I can probably uh, bring the discussion a little bit back to uh, to the human aspect. And actually, surprisingly, I have two parts to uh, kind of ideas. Ask answering about Yolena last question about how to make sure that memory photo uh, in the hotel. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the booking case, uh, but I know another example of uh, what is done on Taloka for, for example, collecting the data for the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, we have several clients who are collecting, yeah, like the, the interesting part about the crowdsourcing, uh, taking a step back, aside is that you can not only assign tasks to be performed online for the people, but you can also ask uh, people to perform some minor tasks offline. And one of the popular tasks on Taloka uh, is related to maps producers. Like for example, please go to the certain location and verify that some organization or business really exists there. Like go to this place, verify that there is a this is a business center. Uh, go to this place, verify that this is a cafe, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes when we talk about the business center, of course, there are also signals from the online because the, those organizations are registered in uh, business directories, et cetera. But sometimes if we talk about the flower shop or something else, something, uh, the guy who just restores the boots or something like that, they, they just simply do not exist in online so the only way to obtain the information about such organization is to literally ask people go offline and verify that they are there and there from the point of view of the crowdsourcing we have this problem like okay some people bring us some photos like saying this is this organization how do we verify that they really this is about that organization yeah, so we verify <laughs> uh, so we match the uh, lo 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 yeah the geo data yeah, yeah. yeah the, the the geo data about the coordinates of the expected place and the photo where it has been taken yeah. and if they are far away it's quite easy to track uh, like automatically so i can go to the hotels and make sure the images are from the hotel okay okay, one okay. By one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> so is for that. Yeah, please register. Uh, and also uh, having the the previous question about the aesthetics uh, of the images uh, from what we see, because uh, if if I'm talking about from sitting in a hat uh, of. Uh, like Taloka, uh, we as a platform have many different uh, clients uh, making many different use cases. What we see there is the approach how to measure really aesthetics uh, using the human yeah. judgments to use it further as a ground truth for, for the models. And what do people do is actually use the side-by-side -side comparison because quite often it's very hard if you show the picture, say, is it beautiful on the scale of one to 10? Uh, it's quite hard to measure, but if you show two images saying which one is better, uh, it's very easy. Every person can uh, compare two images and say which one is better. And if you co collect large amounts of such judgments with huge overlap, asking hundreds of people about the same pair and asking about many, many pairs, as a result, you get the ranked list of all the objects actually ranked by the popularity of the votes they get. And thus, you can use this as the ground truth for aesthetics uh, from the human point of view. Yeah, so there is a question. So please go ahead. 
Well, perhaps to follow on what you said is why, why don't we have like sentiment analysis for pictures? We have it for texts. I mean, what you said could be translated. If you, if I, I would even imagine UI, UI wise, like a slider that you can perhaps, but if you go for binary, okay, I mean, if we, we know that we can judge a review based on the tokens. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do it? Uh, just start and do sentiment analysis for images. And then perhaps later we can see, okay, we can identify beaches are more, uh, I mean, like with tokens, that like beaches are more popular than forests or so. Uh, sorry, thank you. I could answer that uh, again from the point of view. Uh, well, if we speak about crowdsourcing, meaning that uh, crowds, uh, when I speak about crowdsourcing, I mean some scalable uh, and repeatable usage of human efforts. So this is, uh, we need to develop some method that can be repeatable. And we, when we ask one person or another, or today or 10 days later, it will work in a, a predictable manner. That's why uh, like we need something that can be more or less formally controlled. When we speak about side-by-side -side comparisons, it is something that can be controlled. You show the same pair of objects to hundreds of people, about every person who is making those decisions, you calculate lots of statistics. You calculate his or her consistency with the others. You calculate it matching with some meta information about those objects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can even inject some, we call them honeypots. So some uh, verification checking tasks where we definitely know which one is better and which one is worse. And we also track the percentage of the cases when a person votes for the um, incorrect task. And that's why this is uh, something that is manageable and scalable. We can, once we have created such a pipeline, it can work on and on and on. Like Leanna showed today, their pipeline is running every day. And actually all the people who participate there, like Leanna probably like doesn't know and <laughs> or doesn't care who is there. On the, that care, side. Yeah, yeah, because everybody is just every participant is described by some vector of uh, parameters. Like we know that uh, he qualified for the express tasks, he has a certain quality in this and this and this. Uh, unfortunately, if we speak about the slider task, it's much harder to formalize it. If you uh, ask two people to rank on a slider, uh, they uh, their judgments will be very much. Uh, disconnected probably Dima can add here because he's been uh, investigating and researching uh, the tasks about consistency of the human judges and methods of aggregation there Dima maybe you can add here about the slider or some other well in a few words um, in if you use expert annotators if you want to rely on humans who have some time to learn about your instructions and your requirements, you can follow the way the search engines do it. So they have 100 pages of instructions and people who are admitted to these annotations are experts because they read and understood all those instructions. And they can differentiate between one scale of one to 100. But in crowdsourcing, if you apply non-expert annotators, you have to rely on pairwise comparisons. You should ask a simple question like, what is more preferable, this forest picture or this uh, CSI picture, for example, in your uh, question? And uh, you just leave the annotators with one simple question that they can quickly answer in their own head without taking too uh, much effort while reading the instruction. And they, uh, by selecting A or B, they can give you the proper annotation. Unfortunately, it somewhat makes a bit difficult, uh, makes it a bit difficult to control the quality because you have to do some synthetic data to control that the answers are not random and you have to spend some effort for aggregating this stuff, but it's more or less solved problem. So after a few modifications, it should work for you. Uh, so, and it brings us to the second part of our uh, questions. What is, what do you like most about content uh, moderation with machine learning? And how do you deal with these uh, disadvantages? Because we've seen through the slides that people rely a lot on machine learning. You can save a lot of uh, human effort by asking the model who trained on the labels to predict whether it's okay or not okay to show this um, uh, advertisement to the general audience. However, this approach for automation should have its advantages and disadvantages. So I 
I think we should turn in the reverse way. So from booking.com to uh, AliExpress, uh, how do you live with all those advantages and disadvantages of your automated content moderation pipelines? Yeah, so I think, uh, like I described before, that it's kind of uh, different from our, for our use case because um, we are building uh, general machine learning models that are used from all booking um, departments. So we are not, I'm not actually part of this automation, um, but we send the predictions to the uh, moderation teams and they're building their own, their own automation pipeline that are using this prediction along with other predictions. So this is just a part of the moderation uh, automation. Um, but what if the model gets it wrong? How do you do? If the model gets what? Gets it wrong, makes a mistake. What so that's that's what I mentioned before. Like we give uh, a score for uh, different labels. Uh, we have like 20 labels that moderation asks for, for them. And for each one of them, uh, they're taking like very low threshold to approve, automatically approve uh, the image. And for a higher threshold, they are um, reviewed um, like manually. Um, so that's what we do. And we actually did the model that we built is uh, based on um, take data, annotated data um, that we tag. And we know using the test set, what is the best threshold to use and uh, that uh, like we get recall of one to catch this image and we are not like um, taking less than that. We need recall one. We are not, uh, even if the precision is very low. Mm -hmm. um, cool, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Gal. So what's your, uh, what's, what do you think about the advantages of automated moderation and disadvantages of it? How do you do it? So I think that the key is uh, monitoring. Basically, starting with a, we have a rollout plan, starting with a very low or high threshold, and we send it to a manual review, like starting with 50% of the decisions are being reviewed. Once we can see that the precision or recall, whatever we care about, is higher than what we want, we can reduce the amount of monitoring and change the threshold. So it's not like we launch with the final threshold that we want. The higher the confidence gets, then we tweak the threshold uh, according to the performance. So monitoring is the way to go in my experience. Yeah, and uh, monitoring and uh, indeed the people who will react to these monitoring alerts and so on. So they have to react quickly to adjust the system so they don't um, make so much damage <laughs> if it goes wrong, right? Yeah, so for some risky categories, they get an email. If by mistake we, we identify that the image might, might be unsafe, we send a, an image alert. But for the others, like, they're like sweeping queues and they go item by item according to the risk score and double check. And if needed, they're gonna reject the item. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what? Yeah, uh, I usually turn the airplane mode on when I go to sleep. So no emails for moderation. That's why you don't work in moderation? I don't work uh, when I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Olga, what do you think? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Oh, to be honest, I think it's impossible to add anything after Gal's answer yeah. and after your uh, talk today, because it was very comprehensive in terms of uh, the way moderation works. Uh, in general, uh, speaking about what I don't like about moderation, and you mentioned it as well, is that nobody noticed if everything is all right. Uh, nobody ever will thank you like, wow, what a cool moderation you have. <laughs> nobody just notices anything and that's the best you can get uh, but uh, it's very easy out of millions of objects to find the one uh, mistake and definitely your ceo will find it and call you at 2 a.m that's what i don't like about the domain of moderation to be honest <laughs> thank you elena yeah right uh i actually have two different answers one is realistic but funny uh, second is realistic, but a bit more serious. I'll start with a funny one. Actually, Gal, when you presented your uh, talk, you uh, also mentioned the metrics you use, like recall, precision, uh, and they spoke about cultural differences. So uh, my question to you and to the audience is, do you guys think all people in the world who do ML use these metrics uh, as KPIs for the ML teams? The actual answer is definitely no. Uh, in some no-named company, uh, some no-named Chinese ML team does not use these metrics at all. 
the only metrics they have, we have, uh, was initially bad cases metrics. And yes, it was realized exactly in the way you have described. Someone found the bad case and that's put on your KPI metrics. And you are judged not by the quality of your model or your recall or your precision. You know what? Just by the amount of bad cases you've solved. By the way, if no one found any bad cases, guess what the level of your bad cases resolvement is? Right, guys, you are here. <laughs> that's how it was, actually, and that's true. Uh, what do we do now with bad ML cases? We're actually using our real users. As you saw, we also have this feedback. And now we have this, you know, championship between our CEOs and our users, who is first to find the bad case. So the better we work, the more users we have, the less the probability for our CEO to be the first to find something. That's what we do here. Involved is your CEO in finding these issues. We have two. <laughs> Twice as effort. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have at least one more topic. Oh, yeah. So we have a question, please. Sir. Yeah. So my name is Vladimir. I'm working at Millennium. I previously worked at Taloka as well. So uh, my question is, uh, is as following. So you are, so this is the question mainly to Yelena and to, I forgot your name, the Tableau guy. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you're using human uh, answers, human labeling as an input for your machine learning. And you are labeling uh, advertisements. And so some of your advertisements might be legal today and illegal tomorrow. For example, if you are labeling something like um, medicine, you might be able to solve uh, to sell them today and the the law might pass and prohibit this tomorrow so now you have a huge amount of data that lay that labeled those um advertisements that says that it's legal and the next day it becomes illegal and you have like a big portion of your data that is mislabeled so how do you deal with this thank you for the question uh, <laughs> the, the, the world of uh, content moderation is very dynamic, right? One day something is okay, something is not okay, or maybe, for example, a celebrity died yesterday, and there's an article about him tomorrow. But so, and so we, you have to be dynamic. And as for the data set, which is trained on the war, wrong policy, we are dealing with such problems. And part of the track that we're having with communication between uh, policy automation and the human review is to communicate the policy when it changes. And then we can uh, do like a um, model versioning according to the policy and we have to retrain the model. It is very hard to track and the policy keeps, keeps changing. It's one of the biggest challenges in AI and automation in quantum moderation, yeah. the changing policy. Yeah. Kind of data drift happens. So we had at least one more question here. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, my name is Alex. First of all, thanks for all this interesting information. So my question is, we spoke about the unintentional errors of ML algorithms. What about the intentional errors when cyber criminals will want to bypass those algorithms? And how are you planning to deal with that or how are you already dealing with that? I'm sure probably didn't fully get your question, but cyber criminals don't have access to our inner services and inner resources. So even if they want to, they just don't get access to my ML model. What they can do, on the other hand, they can hire many, many annotators, make some, I don't know, secret pact outside it, and create some many very false judgments about my very items. But actually, the effort that it would cost is much more than they would learn through Taloka about these judgments. So I still don't see what the, what's their profit. Mm, all right. So, and we are very close to the next section of our panel discussion. Uh, we have been talking about models, about moderations, about labels, about other stuff that is, you know, kind of computational. But all those labels, all those staffs are evaluated by real humans who submit labels. And my question is, how does a content moderator's typical day look like? So let's talk about humans. 
And who, who wants to start? We have people with uh, internal teams of moderations. We have the baseline between them. <laughs> and we have people who use crowdsourcing. Who wants to start? Olga, you can start if you, you have the microphone. I, I, I can start uh, because I have kind of experienced both models. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so uh, what did, uh, speaking about our uh, my personal experience uh, in dealing with the moderation tasks, when we uh, started that project of like reformatting the whole organization of moderation, uh, the situation was the following. We had uh, like roughly speaking, hundred of uh, in-house experts and their day uh, was uh, like they wake up in the morning, go to the beautiful office in the center of the city, uh, pour a cup of coffee, chat with the friends in a, in a coffee break uh, place. Uh, then they start moderating and actually do this kind of routine job for eight hours a day. Then they go back uh, home and that, uh, repeats for 10 years on. Now, uh, what uh, we had, and truly the, those people needed to have very high quality of training prior to starting working, because for example, one single ad uh, should have been labeled by 75 different tags. And the people were really proud by their ability to label every task uh, in the 75 different tags. Uh, but I see several problems in this approach. Well, well, like the whole system resulted in the fact that it, uh, at some moment, uh, the system like reached the limits of scalability, of manageability, and cost effectiveness of this approach. So it worked until some moment perfectly, but then uh, we needed to restructure the whole system. Uh, I, I see two kind of problems there. Speaking about like 75 tags and the, the amount of months you need to train a person and onboard them in order to be able to carefully label that. First of all, is like I said, and like you guys mentioned, you really need to invest lots of time to train and onboard a person in order to learn all these rules. Secondly, it's a problem that if a person makes one mistake out of 75 tags, does it mean that he or she is good or bad from the point of view of the person? Like one out of 75 is not a big of problem. Uh, but from the point of view of the business logic, this one uh, incorrectly put tag may cause like quite a big problems for the business. And it's very hard to track. That's why uh, in Taloka, we always try to decompose the task into a set of smaller and simpler tasks, which are easier to control actually, and easier to remember. Some of them do not require such long onboarding and training. For example, this particular case with 75 tags was this decomposed into 10 different tasks, which were binary or almost binary. Uh, and the second part, uh, speaking about human, is that I do believe that uh, especially um, going forward, looking forward in the world where there is more and more AI, like I wouldn't like to see the world divided into people who create fancy models, etc., and people who really sit uh, for eight hours a day doing, roughly speaking, monkey job uh, without any professional development and etc. So what we ended up uh, is actually this uh, decomposition when we send the majority of tasks, which roughly speaking, 80% of every task, every tasks are subject to decomposition and to be solved by the crowdsourcing, where people just freely plug in to the system whenever they have time, whenever they have mood, it can be 10 minutes a day, one hour a day, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody is forced, as in the case of the Facebook, uh, to sit and monitor and moderate cruel content for eight hours a day. We know there are lots of tragic stories about that. And on the other hand, people who stay with and keep this expertise, they uh, having released the majority, like big part from of their load to automation and to crowd, uh, they can spend their efforts on actually doing more expert jobs, such as working on those policies, uh, writing the guidelines, systematizing the mistakes, uh, actually constructing those pipelines for crowdsourcing or learning machine learning by themselves. And that, I believe, is a more proper 
like distribution of human efforts in in any task okay thank you and let's now listen to the experience of tabula and bookin who have sorry i've been talking too long you yeah. should have started uh, we are here to talk so please do <laughs> yeah uh, so could you please share your experience in you know what is the average typ typical day of your content moderate uh, moderation team members sure so we have the two months onboarding followed by a routine of um, shift managers that assign campaigns to the reviewers. Each reviewer usually reviews like 250 campaigns. Each one has in average like seven advertisements. Go campaign by campaign and should make four different labeling decisions, not 75. And the tricky part is that even if they reject a specific advertisement, they should they reject it due to the correct rejection reason. Okay, don't just reject. Why did you reject? Because first of all, it's the consistency for our AI models, but also when you com communicate to the customers, we want to give them the right rejection reason so that they will be able to correct. So communication is also a very important aspect in content review because there's an end, end user that's gonna get this rejection. So we work hard on training them on selecting the right uh, rejection reasons. So this is one part, the proactive moderation before it gets approved. But after it gets approved, we have this process called sweeping. So sweeping is about going over a queue of already approved advertisement and double checking that we didn't do a mistake. Oh. Is there a labeling mistake or an approval mistake? So that's another side. 5%, only 5% according to the risk score. Okay. Cool, very cool. That's a very cool insight actually. And uh, Warren, could you please share your experience? How do you do this at Booken? Yeah, so actually the moderation teams are based in Amsterdam, so I hope they uh, at least have uh, some canal, a uh, beautiful canal view. Um, so yeah, the, the work is very, there are two different moderation teams for images and reviews, and uh, the work is very exhausting and uh, specific. Um, I can say like for images, uh, if the image is rejected, we know the exact label that was identified in the image. So we are using like, uh, we retrain the model with, uh, this kind of annotations because we get them for rejected images that we know that there was a specific label in this image. Um, uh, okay, so, and, uh, but generally, uh, so you said you have the moderator team in Amsterdam, right? Yeah. So they are like um, uh, employees of Booking who are, so you have multi, many thousands of hotels and uh, many thousands of users, maybe millions of users, and uh, you have a single team in a single city that does all these things? That's yeah, a we have two teams, things. different for, uh, one different from images and one different from reviews. And actually, um, it's just for new, like joint images. Like if there is new image that is uh, coming to booking, we need to moderate it. If it's, if it's automated, moderate, it's okay. But if not, so they need to go over it. But we already did the heavy lifting of all existing images and reviews. So it's just for new coming ones. And for that, yeah, it's, they are handling it. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And the last, uh, so Elena, do you have maybe form, uh, some things about the the difference between uh, other companies and AliExpress that you applied uh, for, for you know, scheduling the moderation efforts? Uh, the only thing I'm like keeping thinking about, sorry for pseudonym, is that like we all all I use that Chinese companies are really that big and have very big teams, and here I am sitting here without any content moderation team, and doing where I turn the wrong turn. I mean, everyone has it, and we don't. Uh, I I I'm not sure we would never create such a team inside AliExpress. We actually do have a team. It's not content moderation. It's more about legal and seller connections, uh, about spe special categories, as you can uh, easily understand. Some types of items are required to be specifically certified or specifically checked or need special docs to be presented before we are allowed to sell them. So probably we should think about this team as our kind of content moderation team taking into account that our content here is not digital, but physical as well. Probably that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are a bit out of time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, our panel of moderators. And uh, a few last things. The first one is uh, if 
you can see the slides, you should see the label like feedback and more ideas for the next event. Please scan the QR code and submit the feedback for the next event. Uh, we will share the recordings and the presentations to you after the event. Am I right? Right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So tomorrow I'm going to send you presentations and the link from YouTube. But then we're going to have a nice videos like from one, two talks and one panel discussion. So you also can share it in social media. And also we're going to have some photos. As you know, we have a photographer now. So if you were on the picture, so also please share it in social media. So we're going to get more people for these meetups and uh, we're going to share like for ML community.